Okay, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. I hope you're all safe and healthy wherever you are and in spite of your government. I'm certain we have a wide international audience right now because today we have the pleasure and the honor to listen to William LaBeouf at the Zebralin supported event, Linguists Online. As you know, Linguists Online is promoted by the Brazilian Linguistics Association, Abdelin, in cooperation with CIPL, the Permanent International Committee of Linguists, ALFAO, the Latin American Association of, of Linguistics and Philology, SAEL, the Argentine Society of Linguistic Studies, the LSA, Linguistic Society of America, and the LAGB, Linguistics Association of Great Britain. We thank Tragic Points for providing simultaneous translation to Portuguese. My name is Livio Oshiro. I'm a sociolinguist at the University of Campinas. And out of the many other more important people who could be here in my shoes today, it turned out to be my privilege to introduce Bill LaBeouf. LaBeouf is one of the very few who truly does not need an introduction. So, because we are all very familiar with his groundbreaking books and articles, I'd like instead to highlight some of LaBeouf's contribution that may not be immediately visible. When reading Sally Taliamonti's Making Waves, the story of variation is sociolinguistics. It's not hard to see at least two major patterns in sociolinguist stories of how they become a sociolinguist or how they've come to be associated with Bill LaBeouf. The first pattern is some variation of the statement, when I first read X, X being the social stratification of English in New York City, or the logic of non-standard English, or the social motivation of a sound change, among others. So when I first read X, I thought it was brilliant, and I wanted to do the same. There are few such statements by linguists such as Greg Guy, Peter Treadgill, and John Rickford. And incidentally, that was also my case. When I first read Empirical Foundations for a Theory of Language Change, co-authored by Weimar, Klabov, and Herzog, I just knew that's what I wanted to do. Now, the second pattern we find in Sally's book is people saying, we were interested in doing something similar to Labov's work in New York City, so we contacted him. And then we learned that Labov has been directly or indirectly responsible for helping setting up projects such as Roger Schweiss' collection of 700 plus sociolinguistic interviews in Detroit in the 1960s, the Montreal Corpus, organized by Gillian Sankoff and Rietta Sedergren and David Sankoff in the 1970s, or of special importance to us in Brazil, the Mobral and later on the PU Corpora collected at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro with Greg Guy's fundamental help and Tony Naru and Miriam Lemley's leadership, which set the spark for many other similar projects in Brazil. So to put it shortly, Labov's willingness to share his knowledge has helped set up sociolinguistic research groups all over the world. And getting in contact with his work is always inspiring. So I invite you all now to get inspired by William Labov in his talk, Justice as a Linguistic Matter. Labov, thank you so much for accepting Abraline's invitation. The floor is yours now. Your turn, Bill. Say hi. Hello, good morning. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be talking about <clears throat> justice as a linguistic matter. The subject of this paper stems from the evaluation of my work by a committee that awarded the Talcott Parsons Prize of the American Association of Arts and Sciences in 2019. The committee recognized the contributions I've made to the quantitative analysis of linguistic change and variation for the development of linguistics as a science. <clears throat> and they also noted that throughout his career, social justice concerns have fueled Lebeau's research. I'd like to explore here the connection between these two aspects of my work. Since it's not obvious how the analysis of linguistic variation leads to advances in social justice. The Merriam Webster Dictionary's treatment of justice revolves about those senses of just that mean conforming to fact or reason, 
and those that mean morally upright or good. <clears throat> Social justice generally refers to the equal distribution of wealth, opportunities, and privileges. If the quantitative approach to linguistic analysis can move the speech community in that direction, it's encouraging for the future of our field. With that thought in mind, I'd like to examine the social impact of linguistic analysis in some of the most prominent chapters of the research that I've been involved in over the past 60 years. And I'd like to thank the help my colleague, Gillian Sankoff, who has been very important in all these developments. Now I entered the study of linguistics after 10 years as an industrial chemist. I was a maker of printing inks and I brought with me the habits of numerical recording, testing and experimentation. I left behind a career of accumulation of trade secrets and entered into the pursuit of the universal properties of human language at Columbia University. There, I found a very different mode of gathering data. For most linguists at that time, it was by asking the question, can you say this, can you say that? It occurred to me that the field could profit by the adoption of the new invention, the tape recorder, which preserved what people actually did say. I also found that it was good <clears throat> that I brought my numerical habits with me because there was considerable variation in the way that people said the same thing. In my effort to record linguistic variation, I introduced the concept of the linguistic variable, a closed set of possible options which could be used to calculate frequencies. It wasn't clear how widely it would be accepted. The only numbers in most linguistic articles were the numbers on the pages. <clears throat> so I expected decades of stiff resistance to the quantitative study of change in variation. But I was surprised. <clears throat> My first report on the social motivation of a sound change on Martha's Vineyard was greeted with a wave of approval at the national meeting of the Linguistic Society of America. I then took a course in survey methodology with Herbert Hyman of Columbia's Bureau of Applied Social Research. I carried out a study of New York's Lower East Side using a subset of the sample created by Richard Cloward and Lloyd Olin for their study of delinquency and opportunity. This diagram is typical of the linguistic results. It takes off from the observation that in New York City, R will sometimes be pronounced like a vowel, depending on who is speaking to who. Thus, New York may be pronounced New York or New York, or hardcore may be pronounced as hardcore. Unless R is followed by a vowel, as in horrible, where it's always a consonant. <clears throat> the vertical axis on this diagram shows the percent pronunciation of R, the horizontal axis, the style of speech in the interview, ranging from the most casual speech to the reading of word lists. And the various lines show the graduated performance of speakers from five social classes. The pattern was so regular <clears throat> that the Columbia sociologists said to me, you don't have to use statistical analysis to detect the pattern of independent factors here, social class and style with the additional feature of crossover by the lower middle class in the most careful styles. For this work and the further efforts of myself and my students were accepted as a valuable addition to the field of linguistics, as long as they were based on the closed set of values that were the results of linguistic analysis. Many other speech communities were studied, Detroit, Boston, San Francisco, London, Sydney, 
and many other languages in Paris, Buenos Aires, Rio de Janeiro, Helsinki. Well, by the time the second edition of the New York City study was published, 35 other cities had been studied on this model. The N-Wave meeting devoted to this approach to linguistic analysis is in its 49th year and the journal Language Variation and Change is in its 32nd year. Variation in dialects has been found to be controlled by sets of many independent variables and linguistic change has been found to be controlled by the interaction of linguistic and social variables. Well, directly following the citation of this work on linguistic variation, the committee has a discussion of social justice and my efforts to improve literacy for speakers of stigmatized languages. And it doesn't immediately follow that the quantitative study of linguistic variation led to an involvement with such matters. It's true that the New York City dialect was heavily stigmatized and most of our subjects had strong feelings about it. But it was rare to find someone whose life chances had been injured by the way they talked. Well, it's true that the New York City dialect was heavily stigmatized and most of our subjects had strong feelings about it. But it was rare to find someone whose life chances had been injured by the way they talked. From the point of view of linguists who put all dialects on an equal plane, New Yorkers are unjust to their own dialect, but it's not the type of social problem which calls for social justice. The link that did lead in that direction was a methodological one. The 24% of speakers in my sample who were African-Americans did represent the Lower East Side, but there's reason to think that they represented the speech of neighborhoods that were 100% African-Americans. No reason to think that. So I applied for funds from the Office of Education to provide a linguistic analysis of what we then recognized as non-standard Negro English. I proposed to find out if there was a connection between that speech pattern and the high rate of reading failure in Harlem schools. We sampled an adult neighborhood in Harlem with methods similar to the Lower East Side. But the main study was focused on local street groups on On and 12th Street, where we rented a clubhouse not far from the university. We enlisted two young African-American men to interview the members of local street clubs, the Cobras, the Jets, the T-Birds. They were recorded as individuals and as groups. One of the linguistic variables that drew most attention was the realization of the copula, which connects the subject of the sentence with various other elements. It may be realized as am, is, or are, or contracted to mmus, or, or reduced to zero in African-American vernacular English. Some linguists saw this as evidence that AAVE was related to the Creole languages of West Africa and the Caribbean. So we have he fast and everything he do, everybody not black. But instead of zero, we also encounter contracted and full forms, as in that's what he is, a brother. The quantitative study of these copula forms turned out to be a major result of the Harlem research. The frequency of full, contracted, and zero forms was determined by the preceding and following grammatical context, as well as the age and social history of the speaker. In the final analysis, it appeared that whatever standard English could contract, AAVE could delete. And conversely, where standard English could not contract, shown by an asterisk here, AAVE could not delete strong evidence that they share a common structure. So here we see in standard English, he's as nice as he says he's, is impossible. And in AVE, 
it's impossible to say he's as nice as he says. The next slide shows the frequency of full contracted and deleted forms of the copula for phenomenal subjects and full noun phrases for four street groups and white adolescents from neighboring regions of the city. So here we have percentages of full contracted and deleted forms of these with pronoun subjects or other noun phrase subjects for six groups in single and group style. The uniformity of the pattern for the AAVE speakers is evident. And also the way in which AAVE is welded into a common structure with standard English. There are features of AAVE which are independent of other, other iodocs, such as the aspect marker of stressed bin, which designates conditions that have been true for a long time and are still true. But the figure in slide eight epitomizes the finding of the Harlem study, supported by many others, arguments that AAVE is a dialect of English. The study of linguistic variation in other cities showed that this and other structural relationships were quite uniform across the country. New York, Detroit, Berkeley, Los Angeles, Texas, they show a common pattern for the deletion of the copula, least of all before noun phrases, and increasingly before adjectives, locatives, verbs, and future constructions with going to or gonna. So a quantitative analysis of this common structure have played a major role in the development of new techniques of multivariate analysis, as well as the social evaluation of dialects. This analysis of linguistic structure is not readily absorbed by many educational psychologists. Breiter and Engelman contended that African-American youth had no language at all, that the absence of the copula was the absence of any logical structure whatsoever. Breiter reports that the black four-year-old children they studied, quote, could make no statements of any kind or quote, the language of culturally deprived children is found is merely an underdeveloped version of standard English, but is a basically non-logical mode of expressive behavior. If children should answer the question, where's the squirrel with the vernacular form in a tree, they would be reprehended by various means and made to say, the squirrel is in the tree. After two years of immersion in the Harlem neighborhoods, we were in a good position to assess the relation of dialect structure to education and social mobility. The next slide contains results first published in the Teachers College record. It shows grade level and reading level for two groups of speakers between group four and group, grade four and grade 10 in school. 32 isolated individuals, which we call the lanes, and the 16 group members, 46 group members. In addition, there is serious sign of social conflict. The symbols with arrows indicate there are eight members who had been expelled or suspended from school. Now the lames on the left were not good readers. They were as a whole a year behind the school norms. The blue diagonal shows the few who are on grade level in reading. But the street group members were much worse and the difference between them grew greater with age. The group members had an absolute ceiling of fifth grade and only one of the 46 was on grade level. In addition, 
This slide shows strong evidence of social conflict between the school system and African American youth. Only one of the lambs had been expelled or suspended. But eight of the group members indicated by arrows that they were no longer allowed in school. 13 others have been marked as behavior problems in the school's disciplinary records. We also found no correlation with linguistic ability. The triangles on this diagram represent speakers who had found, we had found were outstanding in verbal ability within the vernacular domain of narrative, song, and ritual insults. In the interviews and group sessions, we find full expression of the conflicts between the vernacular norms and those of the dominant one society, including the educational psychologists. Now the paper that I wrote entitled The Logic of Non-Standard English attempted to do justice to the logic of AAVE. Most often reprinted was a discussion between the interviewer, Casey, and Larry Hawthorne, a 16-year-old member of the Jets. And suppose there's a guy. Mm -hmm. Would he be white or black? He'd be white, man. Why? Why? I'll tell you why. Because the average whitey out here got everything. You dig? And the nigga got shit, you know? You understand? So um, for um, all then for that to happen, you know there ain't no black guard that's doing that bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got to go for that, boy. Hey, that's quite a bit this, man. The climactic sentence, it ain't no black God, uses three rules that are all linguists regard as perfectly logical, though non-standard. Use of it in place of the dummy subject there, ain't as the contraction of is not, and the reinforcement of the negative with no. These are matters of surface formulation. They're not the semantics of meaning. Well, Larry's statement is not so much a cry for social justice as an assessment of the situation that highlights the injustice of that situation. Well, the weight of social linguistic information on AAVE accumulated until it was brought to bear in a cry for social justice through legal channels. This happened in Ann Arbor, Michigan the Board of Education in that town, in an effort to diminish racial segregation, had promised, promoted the construction of low-income housing in an upper middle-class area. It was considered to have an excellent school, the Martin Luther King School. But after a few years, it appeared that something had gone terribly wrong. African-American parents in this housing project brought suit against the city and the state for failing to teach black children to read. They alleged that A, the Ann Arbor School District had placed or threatened to place five children in classes for the mentally handicapped. B, placed or threatened to place two of them in classes and programs for learning disabled children. C, suspended or threatened to suspend two others from classes and so on. Now, linguist Geneva Smitherman of Wayne State University organized the prosecution's case, providing 184 extracts from the tape recordings of the school children. Tabulating the results on their use of the copula, she showed the same pattern we saw in the Harlem study. I was among the array of linguists she summoned to demonstrate that AAVE was a distinct system. Now, Judge Charles Joyner, 
delivered his opinion on July 12th of 79. He found the complaint valid, citing President Nixon's 1972 message to Congress. Quote, so school authorities must take appropriate action to overcome whatever language barriers exist, unquote. He found that all of the distinguished researchers and professionals testified to the existence of a language system, which is a part of the English language, but different in significant respects from the standard English used in the school setting. A judge Charles Joyner then found for the plaintiffs and directed the Ann Arbor School Board to submit to him within 30 days a plan defining the exact steps to be taken. One, to identify the children speaking Black English, and two, to use that knowledge in teaching students how to read standard English. In the years that followed, not much progress has been made in following Judge Joyner's direction. Programs for quantitative analysis. Wait, we're losing, we're missing a page. We're missing a page. Between African American vernacular English and standard English, I've met violent objections from parents, teachers, and the general public who have not absorbed the linguistics view of Black English, as is later evident in the Ebonics controversy following the work of the Oakland School Board. But the issues have been stated. The Linguistic Society of America has taken a stand in a position paper by John Rickford, who was then president of the society. And more than one program for contrastive analysis is underway. In addition to myself, linguist Lisa Green, Ann Charity Hudley, and Christine Rallinson, among others, have initiated programs specifically directed to teachers who need to know more about the language of the children they're teaching. The testimony and issues of the Ann Arbor case bear on the issues of this presentation. As I wrote at that time, my aim here is to show how linguistic analysis can be applied to an important issue and then to resolve, if I can, the contradiction that was present at the outset between the objectivity needed for linguistic research and commitment to a social position as an adversary situation. I came to the University of Pennsylvania in 1970, where I taught two courses that played a major role in the development of quantitative analysis. One, the study of the speech community, where students entered local Philadelphia neighborhoods to gather speech data, and two, quantitative analysis, where they learned to analyze it. My colleagues, Gillian Sankoff, joined me in 1979 she focusing on multilingual communities and me on the single dialects that are learned early in life. Over the decades, we received strong support from NSF and from the university, sustaining the first of many social linguistic labs. Well, in more recent years, we've developed at Penn computational methods that can analyze our recordings measuring simultaneously the physical and social dimensions of the data. The FAVE program, F-A-V-E, to analyze the changes in the sound system of the language, was developed at Penn with great gains in speed and accuracy. It's now used by our colleagues throughout the world. And we're very pleased to report that the University of Pennsylvania library has digitized our entire archive of 7,100 interviews, just a thousand of my own, to create the Penn Social Linguistic Archive. And we're working with the Linguistic Data Consortium 
to make it available to other researchers. Now my report on the Ann Arbor trial included a principle of the debt incurred. An investigator who has obtained linguistic data from members of a speech community has an obligation to make knowledge of that data available to the community when it has need of it. By that time, my own salary was 10 times what it had been in Colombia. But the speakers who had recorded in, we had recorded in Harlem had suffered a different fate. Language in the inner city, my book based on the language of the African-American youth we had recorded in Harlem began with the dedication to the Jets, the Cobras, and the Thunderbirds, who took on all odds and were dealt all low cards. At that time, I had not yet found a way to use our linguistic knowledge to contribute to the African-American community. And the situation in Philadelphia neighborhoods was no better than it had been in Harlem. At Penn, we finally did get around to doing something useful with our knowledge of AAVE. I had a strategic lunch with Ira Harkavy of the Netter Center. The, at the university organization committed to social justice. I converted my course on African-American vernacular English to an academically based service co learning course. Now, over 10 years, we support from NSF and elsewhere, we developed a tutoring program that gives children an understanding of how the alphabet works within a broader view of who is to blame for what's wrong with the world. This diagram reflects our understanding of the way in which AAVE interacts with that wider world. But the instruction of the tutoring program has content that links it with that world. Content that appears in the central so reading materials for the program. This material in the format of a graphic novel was the reading road. The stories I wrote for the chapters of the reading road drew heavily on what we've learned from the speakers of the dialect. Now one example is the story, Take Off Your Coat. It's about a boy who gets into trouble through doing, doing good. On his way to school, he stops to get a cat out of a tree, but unfortunately rips a hole in his pants. At school, he can't explain why he refuses to take off his coat, and he winds up in detention. These stories illustrate the wealth of experience with social justice. When we ask, were you ever blamed for something you didn't do? The incident that inspired this story actually happened. It was in the school records of Larry Hawthorne, who we heard a few minutes ago, speaking on whether, how, whether God is white or black. Now the reading road presents the world as the readers know it, where they are continually blamed for things they did not do. It, only, it not only says to the reader, you know what I'm saying, but it also says, I am on your side. You don't have to be a good little kid to re learn to read. If the undergraduate tutors responded to the reading road as well, with a grassroots movement that began in 2008 and continues to this day. Penn students do all the recruiting, planning, tutoring, and organizing of the Penn Reading Institute. Where 50 to 60 undergraduate tutors use the reading road to tutor second and third graders in local schools. Now I'm only the guy who gives encouraging talks at the beginning of the year. Now the study of dialect geography 
was originally a conservative and traditional field. Studies of vowel changes, including my own study of New York City, were based upon acoustic judgments of height, backness, and length. But beginning in the 1960s, instrumental methods of acoustic analysis were developed which could apply to field recordings. By the end of the century, great increases in speed and accuracy were made possible by computational developments. In the 1990s, the Penn Social Linguistic Lab undertook a national survey contacting by telephone at least two speakers in every city of the United States and Canada with a population of over 50,000. The result told heavily on the progress of linguistic shifts. Cases of merger, where two vowels collapsed into the same area, and vowel rotations, where the series of vowels moved consecutively. The progress of these changes was an important factor in the development of automatic speech recognition. The mapping of all these systems was accomplished in only a few years and published in the Atlas of North American English in the year 2006. It also provided a dramatic example of how quantitative research can decide matters of social justice. This is the case of Paul Punt Prince of Alley, a cargo handler for the Pan -Amer American Airways in Los Angeles. A series of bomb threats against the airline have been made by telephone and recorded as we'll hear. The police, the prosecutor, and the executives of Pan American Airlines thought that the caller sounded like Prince of Alley, who was known to be a disgruntled employee. When he was arrested in February 1984, he was able to post $20,000 bail. But then the bomb threats continued. In April, he was arrested again and held on $50,000 bail in the Los Angeles County Jail. There he remained until January. Prosecutors had offered him a plea bargain. In June, time served and five years probation for a guilty plea on the first three counts. Prince of Valley refused. Although he knew he faced a possible six to eight years in prison. Since this was a matter of voice identification and Prince of Valley was raised in New York City, the phonetics laboratory at UCLA sent me a copy of the tapes of the original bomb threats and Prince of Valley as soon as I heard the bomb call and Prince of Valley's repetition, repetition and a bomb going off and a bomb going off I knew the Prince of Valley was innocent the bomb threats were made by someone with a solid Eastern New England phonology, and Prince Valley was a consistent New Yorker. But how to convey this to Californians, for whom New York and Boston were identical? People who have this merger have been told that Don and a bomb going off and a bomb going off. Sorry. Is somehow different from dawn to sunrise. But this mystery is hidden from most people. For Californians, as well as speakers elsewhere in the American West and all of Canada, they're homonymous. Don and Don for them. 
The distinction, part of the history of the language, dawn and dawn, is preserved only in the spelling. You would not want a matter of life and death to be decided by points on which ordinary people cannot agree. Now this slide is from our Atlas of North American English and shows our merger for the words dawn and dawn. The green circles show the New Englanders from the Boston area who pronounce dawn and dawn the same, while the New Yorkers to the south say dawn and dawn quite different. That will become a crucial issue when we juxtapose bomb and off in the Pennsylvania trial, in the Pennsylvania trial. The case was tried in front of Judge Gordon Ringer, who also had a connection with President Nixon. He was known as the first judge to order a president to testify in court. I was told that as an expert witness, I was limited to giving my opinion of the evidence. But I looked for a way to establish that Prince of Ali's innocence was a fact. I prepared for the judge. There was no jury. The displays you see on the slide. First, we'll hear the bomb threat caller, and second, Prince of Ali. And a bomb going off. A bomb going off. Acoustic analysis of the bomb threats and Prince of Ali's repetitions demonstrated that Prince of Ali had distinct phonemes for bomb and off, while the bomb threat caller used a single phoneme. The measurement of the first and second formants show that the bomb threat caller has a single range for these two phonemes, while Prince of Ali, like the New Yorkers we saw on the previous slide, has two. Let's hear them one more time, starting with Prince of Ellie, the New Yorker. And a bomb going off. And a bomb going off. And a bomb going off. The judge then said to Prince of Ellie, stand up. Say the Pledge of Allegiance. Prince of Ellie said, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Judge said to me, what can you tell me about that? I said, I chose you a New Yorker because that's the only dialect in the Eastern United States where the short A in flag is raised from A to A. Well, on Monday morning, the judge asked the prosecuting attorney if he had any further evidence to present. He did not. The judge then refused to hear further evidence from the defense. He found the defendant guilty on the basis of the not linguistic guilty. evidence. Not guilty. He found the defendant not guilty on the basis of the linguistic evidence, which he described as objective and powerful. And a bomb going off. Judge. Ringer later told the Los Angeles Times, it was the Oz and the Oz that did it. The prosecutor had to agree with this assessment, saying he attempted to cross-examine me, but quote, there was nothing I could catch him on. Prince of Ali later sent me a thank you card saying that he had spent 15 months in jail waiting for someone to demonstrate the truth of the matter as I had done. I've had many scientific results where the convergence of evidence was so strong that I felt that I had laid hands on the reality behind the surface. But nothing could be more satisfactory for any scientific career than to separate fact from fiction in this case. By means of linguistic evidence, one man could be freed from the corporate enemies who had assailed him, and another could sleep soundly on the conviction 
that he had made a just decision. What then is the relation between objective quantitative multivariate analysis and the search for social justice? From my own experience, it's not a complicated matter. To understand this, to understand the speakers of a language, we must listen to them. And if we listen, they will speak to us clearly and simply and let us know what is to be done to make the world we share a little more just than it was. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for your talk, Labov. We have many, many questions from the audience. Um, I think, uh, first of all, I should say that uh, we have people from everywhere in the world, as I predicted, from the Amazon, uh, Argentina, Canada, Portugal, India, Australia. I'm assuming James Walker is in Australia right now. So uh, uh, it really is a, a, a world event, your talk. Um, I'm going to try to put together a few questions here. Uh, we have many people, and I think I'm going to um, try to paste this on, on the Zoom chat. Uh, so uh, you've given us very compelling evidence that uh, our work as sociolinguists can contribute to social just justice. Uh, and not just in the educational setting, but we have a lot of people in the chat, on the YouTube chat, uh, talking about giving back and how we uh, sometimes forget about it. We don't return to the communities, uh, our findings. And actually it's already started a whole discussion among Brazilians of what we can do to share more and to give back to the communities. So um, there's one question about educational sociolinguistics. This is a line of research proposed by Stella Bertoni Ricardo in Brazil. Um, but uh, more, uh, more broadly, could you talk about, uh, give us a few more examples of concrete actions uh, of uh, different groups, different sociolinguists of how we could give back to the communities we study of the, this principle of the debt incurred. Sweet. Just a minute. Do you have more suggestions about how to give back to communities? Bill's having some little trouble with hearing today, so I'm trying to write out the questions. Can you have any more suggestions about how to give back to communities? I'm, I don't think uh, you, no, can, you can hear the question. Can you hear this question? Do you have some suggestions about how to give back? Or uh, even more broadly, uh, to what extent do you believe, to Wait. what extent one sec, Lindia, please. I think sure. I have an answer here. You have an answer about giving back, Bill? Yeah, go ahead. You, you can talk now. Right. When the linguist in the community interviews large numbers of people, they have a story to tell. Not a standard survey interview, but the kind of social linguistic interview where we open our ears to what people have to tell us. And lots of us have done interviews in big cities. So at the beginning, people are very sometimes refused. My mother told me, You're trying to sell me something. And maybe after about three quarters of an hour, they say, hey, maybe this guy is not selling something. He might be someone that I could use to reach out to the outer world. 
And maybe what I tell him will reach people and help straighten things out. So giving voice to people, he means a lot more than recording their speech patterns. It's a matter of giving them a contact with the outer world. And that's not been designed of many social linguistic interviews. Now, how do we actually reach people? Well, it's in writing up the results. As I look at the many excellent quantitative analyses that are published in N-Wave and other journals, I don't often see the voice of the original speaker. I don't see the details that bring us into his life. And I don't see the recounting of his experience, which he is given to the interviewer. Instead, he's mostly reduced to an invisible digit and a column of figures. Now, John Rickford has done that, particularly in the case of Rachel Gentel in the recent, this recent paper, the presidential address. And Walt Wolfram has done so effectively in the films that he's constructed in from North Carolina, Virginia. Now, some linguists have contributed directly by writing, creating programs for contrastive analysis that I've mentioned in the work of Christine Mallinson and uh, direct participation in the schools can, can be very powerful, but the work that flows particularly from the linguists has to do with speech and what people can do with their own speech. Now I'm actually writing a book at the moment called Conversations with Strangers. And it begins with the notion that the important instruction that parents give their children, don't talk to strangers, is all wrong. And they should talk to strangers because they've a lot to learn from them. And what we learn from strangers will give us a chance to feed back the indebtedness we have to them. Okay, uh, we have uh, other questions as well. We have a number of questions about African American vernacular English and also relating to preto Pretoguese. I don't know if you've ever heard the term. Uh, okay, let me see if I can face this question. Uh, here. So there's one um, a specific, more specific question about um, African American English. Do you still see the stigmatization of Black people for their dialect in New York or this phenomenon disappearing? And related to that question, uh, uh, someone, uh, Maria Carolina, has asked uh, if you could talk about. It's interesting that Sabria Fisher, one of these days, contacted me to ask about this term as well, about uh, uh, African Brazilian Portuguese. And if there could be parallels between African American English in the United States and popular Brazilian Portuguese. And in Brazil, generally talking about race is uh, uh, sort of a taboo we, uh, Brazilian sociolinguistics hasn't talked much about black Portuguese. So uh, these are general questions about uh, uh, African American and African Brazilian varieties of language. 
You know, I think we're faced with one of the most general principles of governing human language. And so I've called the golden age syndrome. People believe that language was somehow initiated in a perfect form and any change from it is deterioration. So we've interviewed thousands and thousands of old people. No old person has ever been heard to say a sentence like, you know, it's so good the way young children talk today, but so much better than when I was a child. When we hear one such sentence, we'll know that there's some change in that basic structure. And that means that whenever people, we call to attention a feature of their dialect that they didn't know about, they are profoundly embarrassed. And in the newspaper articles, which we write about our work, we find that whatever we say about them is first misunderstood because there is no language to convey the information. And secondly, when people understand what we're talking about, they reject it. Now, in our Reading Road program, we try to combat this by talking directly to the teachers, but giving them knowledge doesn't change that basic attitude. So one approach I've taken was to take the most eloquent of the speakers that we encounter and let them talk to the general public. And you heard Larry Hawthorne, uh, that was taken from in my article, The Logic of Non-Standard English, which has been reprinted more than any other article I've written. And for every time they've reprinted the article, there are 10 times they quote Larry Hawthorne. Because he has eloquence. And not every speaker has the same control of the language. I've got dozens of people who I'm trying to give voice to now. So taking advantage of the of the fundamental linguistic capacity of the speakers is a way to counter the fundamental problem we have. Because people hate the way they talk if they think that it's different from what their grandfather said. Yeah, that, that, that's true. And we, we often see this uh, attitude from uh, speakers of uh, the non-standard varieties. Yeah, it's really common to see that they themselves uh, often think that they are uh, in the wrong, right? Um, we have uh, similar questions, but also uh, from Asia uh, that, uh, let me see, uh, do you think, okay, linguistic theories have been the result of research conducted in English and Western societies? As a society is the major part of variationist theory. Uh, does Labov, do you think that uh, your ideas have succeeded in accommodating diverse Asian societies. Uh, uh, there is a, a remark by James Walker. Uh, he mentions uh, an issue that he organized at uh, Asia Pacific language variation. But uh, I think there's still this general question of uh, to what extent do you think that variationist sociolinguistics has been able to address minority languages, uh, other varieties, and not just uh, the Western societies. We're just working on this interpretation. One minute. OK.
So, Bill, the idea is is the type of societies with Asia in Asia in particular with minorities are our methods uh, applicable? Some of the early work which we cited here is related to the class structure of society, which is quite different from society found in Asia and the Pacific and elsewhere. We can generalize by talking about any vertical differentiation, but the relationship of language to that society has to be examined from within the social linguistic structure. Now, what we're mostly concerned with is what a young child here is growing up, leaving his parents' environment and hearing the language of the school, of the playground, of the workplace, and deciding whether it's unconsciously going to dominate the future language rather than his what we call implementation. Now, if we look at for example, the James Stanford, James Stanford study of the acquisition of people in dialect in Southeast Asia, where one particular community has a rule of saying, if you marry somebody from outside that community, You continue your, with your own local dialect, and women do not learn the dialect of the, of the other community. Now, what happens when a person leaves their own community and joins a, a new community is quite different in different parts of the world and has great consequences for the future of the language. So gender differences in the acquisition of language bear upon the future of the community. And the research that we do on gender has to be sensitive to the difference between men and women in their acquisition of the new forms. In the next year, it turned out that women were the most extreme in rejecting the new form. And contributed a great deal to the stigmatization of the language. That's not true in every community. Gender differences are not universal. So I think that two major factors, social class and gender, have been illuminated and explored more in recent times and indicate that Cross-linguistic studies in different communities will benefit by a, a clearer and more an understanding of gender and social class that is specific to that community. Okay. Okay. I think that's I it. Think, question. I'm sorry, Galen. I think that's it for that question. Yes. 
And I think um, uh, we're, I, I know there are many other questions on the YouTube chat, which you can also uh, uh, read later on. Uh, but I think this is a good time to, to wrap up. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sure I've missed uh, a number of questions from the audience, but uh, I'm sure that everybody is so thankful for your talk this morning, uh, Bill and for the opportunities for us to listen to you, to learn with you, uh, and to inspire us uh, in, in our studies, in our actions, and sharing our knowledge with the, with the communities. So thank you so much once again. Well, thank you very much. Okay, um, and uh, I'm reminded by Everlyn that you can also, well, you can watch this again, and you can uh, write a review of this talk too and send to Revista da Bralin. And uh, there's a whole program. There are many other uh, very interesting talks. Gillian Sankoff will be talking to us next week as well. So um, I'm sure we're all looking forward to these other events. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you, Gillian. Thank you, Labov. Thank you.